Let's stand together as we pray this morning and ask for God to reveal himself. Thank you, God, today for the day that we have been given. This is a moment, God, that I pray would be a very, very special and significant time as we call upon you to minister by your Holy Spirit. May you touch, may you equip, may you empower. God, may there be lives that will be transformed this morning because of the power of your word. And Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' marvelous and mighty name, we ask it. And everyone said together, amen. It's always good to hear from you. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to say to you again, Happy New Year. This is part number two. Some of you think I lost the H. No, no. Happy New Year. I introduced this series last Sunday, and I introduced it by telling you the couple of things that I know. You're going to be astounded by what I know. Number one, here's what I know. No one can live without breathing. Isn't that deep? Secondly, here's what I know. No one can live without learning. It's impossible to breathe or to live without learning. We're always learning, always learning. As long as there's breath in our bodies, we're going to be living in the land of discovery. It's in October. I told you last Sunday that I got a brand new cell phone. It's an iPhone 12. Some of you only got iPhone 5. iPhone 5, it's got 60, no, no, it's got 640 gigabyte of memory. I just wonder when they'll ever stop. Ceiling, there's no ceiling on this. Anyway, lots of memory. I, it's got more memory than any staff member in Calvary Temple that they have on their phone. Get it straight. So, I, and once I got this cell phone, I began to get downloads. I'm getting downloads for apps. And I didn't have a clue what app I asked my wife. What does apps mean? What does apps mean? And I got one last week, another message app. I got an app store on my cell phone, but I did not have a clue what an app was, so I began to investigate. Gary, find out what app means. It's very, very simple. App means application. It's a program or a piece of software designed to fulfill a particular purpose. On my phone, there's an app store right at my fingertips. There are more than one million apps and counting. There's an app for everything under the sun. Apps are designed and downloaded. Why? To assist and to help you in your life. So I have four apps that I'm offering to you free of charge. No charge whatsoever. Now last Sunday was we downloaded the prayer app. This Sunday is going to be the Holy Spirit app. Next Sunday is going to be the contentment app. And the Sunday after that is going to be the dream app. So stick with us on this journey that we take. Last uh, I'm praying that you'll have a happy new year. And we just want to set you up for success in this new year. And get, about a couple of weeks ago, we got this in the office. It's called a defibrillator. And I know you've probably seen these, and we, you know, we, we got one. And So I thought maybe that I'd have one installed in my office and give myself a little zap on Sunday morning just to get the old motor running. So maybe I'll try it right now. No, there's no, actually, someone said there's an alarm that'll go off if I try to open up the package. But we'd like to defibrillate your life this morning in this brand new year and get, jumpstart you and give you a boost that you may get your new year in gear the right way. And God would impact your life and transform your marvelous ways, give you the boost you need. Last week, I read or someone told me that Brandon was the coldest place on earth. I believe it. I was here. I believe it. I even read that North Pole was warmer. I even read that Mars was warmer than us. But we are close, so we're going to get through this together. Then I get up this morning, everything's out of whack. It, inside my garage, it's colder than it is outside. Plus two, enjoy it. Winter is now over. It's done with. Bring on spring. I'm going planting my garden next week. Or am I? All I know is we can get through it. So this morning... We're talking about, uh, the first was the prayer app, invite you to apply the privilege. This morning, the Holy Spirit app, we're going to invite you to apply the power. Last Sunday, we looked at Jeremiah 33, verses 1 to 3, where God said, call upon me. Dare to call upon me, Jeremiah. Call upon me. I'll hear you. I'll answer you. I'll show you things that you never, ever would be able to find out on your own. Call upon me, and I'll show you. And we're excited about what we shared last Sunday. And this morning, it's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is exciting. 
subject to speak about. In fact, there's nothing spooky wooky about. We hear a lot of sermons on Jesus and about God, but Holy Spirit sometimes we get silent. There's lots of different views. I know that on the Holy Spirit. Lots of thinking. How does he work? What's he do? I know all that. There's differences, but I do know there's nothing spooky wooky about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has all the personalities of a person. And Jesus said, I'm with you. He said to his followers, his disciples, and his servants, he said, I'm here, but I'm not going to be with you forever. I'm departing. I'm going back to be with the Father. But he said, I'll send you another comforter. I comforted you. I was with you in person, and I was there, listened to you, and I helped you. I assisted you. But now when I go back to be with the Father, I'll send him to you. I will not leave you, he said, as orphans. I will not leave you comfortless, but I'll send him. And he said, when he comes, guess what he's going to do? He'll do something very, very significant. He'll not only be upon you, but he will live in you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that is what I want to share with you this morning. For my text, I've chosen 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Verse 1 says these words, the company of the prophet said to Elijah, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan where each one of us can get a pole and let's build a place there for us to meet. And he said, okay, go. One of them said, won't you please come with your servants? Elijah said, I will. And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. One of them was cutting down a tree. The iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elijah cut down a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and he took it. An incredible story that is. Last Saturday... It was at 7.30 p.m. I know it very, very well because that's when our clock stopped. The power went out. It was minus 80 at our place, minus 35. Minus 35. It's always colder. I always sensationalize my stories a little bit. It was minus 85 at my place. It was cold, and the power went off at 7.30. And when that happened, I knew that we were in trouble. I knew it. I knew this was not good. So, of course, I called, and I reported that we have a power outage. And he said to me, we're very, very busy. Do we not get there for a while? Oh, no. So I just let death set in. And I said to my wife, okay, it's all over. I'm just going to prepare to die. So I got my big wool socks on, put them on my feet, crawled up into bed. Lana stayed out in the living room. And, and, I, and I laid in bed, and I just yelled out updates to her. And I said, it's dropped one degree. I'm now feeling faint. I'm now getting delirious. She knows I'm high maintenance. So I just kept yelling out, updates. Here's how I'm feeling now. We're, we're going down. We're going to freeze to death. Mine is 100. And then suddenly, as I'm lying in bed, I see a light. I thought I was really going home then. You know, <laughs> the light, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's dark. But I saw a light. It was the Manitoba Hydro vehicle. He comes up. And he goes to the pole. And so I, I didn't see close enough, so I got my binoculars out. I'm not going outside. It's minus 100. So I get my binoculars, and I, then I'm still calling out the updates. Here's the truck. My wife and I, I'm not going to look that way. And I'm looking up, and I see what he's doing. So he's got this big, long stick. I can't see very good with glasses on. I can't see him up there. And so I look, and he... He's up there, he's got a stick, he's on the ground, long stick, and he's doing something up there. Looks like he's got a fuse, and then he kind of trips this long fuse, and it hangs the bottom, and then he still, and then he drops it, and then he goes for coffee. He goes in the truck and sits down. I wanted to go out and say, complete the job. At least I thought he might have been there having coffee. Maybe he's going in to get an update or whatever, I don't know. So, I wait, wait. This is a long story, but I want you to know it's worth it. It really drives home the point. What point? I'm not quite sure. 
So I focus and I see him again. He gets this stick out there, and then he looks like he's going to flip this thing to connect two points. So I knew that we're about to get power. And so I start yelling, Lana, get ready. Here comes the power. And suddenly, boom. Sound effects, please. Light effects, please. No, okay. We got power. That happened just so I could put that into my sermon this morning. I know that. God knows all these things. But we got the power. See, power is great when you got it. Power is great when you have it. Power is not so hot when you lose it. Great when you got it. So we flicked our lights afterwards. Just finishing my story now. I forgot this part. I flicked my lights at him just to let him know, thank you. He didn't just look. He didn't do anything else. He just got in his vehicle and drove away. But when you got power, it's great. When you don't have it, it's bad. When the plug comes out of the wall, everything stops. A leader one time of a large denomination brokenheartedly said this. He said, we've lost the power, and we don't know how to get it back. We've lost the power, and we don't know how to get it back. As a church, we will literally, spiritually, freeze to death if we do not have the heat and the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit application. We need to download this power afresh in 2014. Now, our church is affiliated with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Our name is Calvary Temple, but we're affiliated with the PAOC, Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Guess where our name came from? It came from Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, Acts says, they had a Pentecostal experience. They were filled, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and with that firepower, they went out and they were witnesses and powerful, powerful overcomers. Persecution could not stop them. Persecution just made them pr preach and declare even more. You could not stop them because they're filled with the power that came from the promised Holy Spirit into their lives. And so the PAOC, back in the early 1900s, they got together, a group of people began to call upon God. They heard about the Holy Spirit. They heard about the promise. And they said, let's pray for this promise. Let's pray for this power. Let's pray for this baptism. Let's pray for this infilling. And they got together. They just sought God. They prayed together. They called upon God together. They cried together. They waited for the promise. They were excited about it. And the Spirit of God came down and filled them to overflowing. That was the beginning of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. See, the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Keep pulling up to the receptacle and plug in because our engines get cold and really don't start too well when they get cold. Keep pulling up to the fountain with your pail because we as humans, we tend to leak. And we just do that. We leak out. And so Paul says to the inspiration of, the, of God, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. Keep on pulling up to the fountain. Keep plugging into the receptacle. You need the fire. You need the power. You need the ability that the Holy Spirit will give you. Keep the hunger and thirst for the power. So, my scripture this morning that I just read to you is about a great power failure. And it was during the process of growth. It was during the process of expansion. It was good times. There's a point in there, too, that which we don't have time to get into. But it was during the good times that the power was lost. A group of Elisha's prophet students, they come to Elisha, and they said to him, we must build bigger quarters. The school is growing, and more and more room is needed. So we've got to have bigger facilities. So they go down to the Jordan, and what they do is they begin to cut down trees. We've got to build bigger facilities. So then we, we read first of this group, this group that's going to go down and do this, and then it shifts from a group of workers to an individual worker and his individual experience. So he's got his ax out, and he's sweating. He's working hard. He's chopping, he's chopping, and he's chopping, and he's cutting trees down. He's making headway. But in the process, as he's 
swinging his axe, what happens is the axe head comes off. He lost this part. And all he has left is the stick. That's all he's got. The end result is, and he still realizes it's gone. The end result is powerless. He cannot get that tree down. He lost the axe head. Now, I've got seven questions that I've been waiting to ask this young prophet. Now, if we could go somewhere at this particular time and say, let's find a tree stump. I'm sure there's some around here that you didn't, that you cut off about here. Let's sit down. On, I'll sit on this one. You sit on the other one. I've got seven questions. I just want to ask you, young prophet. I've got some questions I'd like for you to try to answer for me. The first one is this. Did you have your mind on other things? Did you get distracted from the main thing? Is that what happened? Number two, I would ask them this question as well. Did you become tired? Did you become weary? Did you forget to have your Wheaties this morning? And you just kind of lost, you become accident prone? A lot of times that's what happens when we get tired and weary, accident prone. Or number three, did you hit, did you happen to strike just a big knot? A big old knot in that tree, and, and you just wound up and you beat that tree as hard as you could to get through that knot, but you lost the axe head. For number four, did you lose your cool? Did you get angry and you just threw that axe down for some reason? Threw it down to the ground, and when you did, the head flew off. For number five, did cutting down trees become common to you? I mean, you've been cutting it for a while here, you were successful, you're doing some, getting some trees down to the ground, did it become common to you and, and you just became too relaxed and, you know, you lost the axe head? But number six, did you lose your focus? Did you take your eyes off and not notice that the axe head was coming off the handle? Because we know these things can happen. In fact, when I was using this one, the head was coming off the handle. It won't come off anymore. One, two, three, four, five, six, no, one, two, I lost count. One, two, three, four, five. I got five deck screws in there and one, two, three, four nails. I don't think it'll come off. But did you, for some reason, take your eyes off it and notice, not notice the axe head was slipping off? The last question I would ask this young prophet is this. Did you try to keep on going? Were you embarrassed? I mean, I'd be embarrassed. I wouldn't want anyone to know right away that I lost the head of the axe. Did you keep on trying to, to chop? Did you make it look good? You know, but after a while, it kind of caught up with you. Uh, those are kind of the questions I would like to have answered this young prophet. And these can be general questions that I could also present to you this morning in the process of life. It can happen so easily in the process of chopping trees down, in the process of living, in the process of productivity when things are going well. Did you have your mind on other things? Did you become tired? Did you become weary because you were working hard? Did you hit a big knot, a big speed bump in the road? Did you get upset with God for some reason? Just fire your faith down. Just fire it down. Said, enough of this. Did cutting trees become common to you? Did living for Jesus become common? Coming to church become common? Taking communion become common? Praying become common? Ministry, did it just become common to you? How about lost focus? Did you take your eyes off the goal? Take your eyes off the cross for just a short time, but you lost your focus. Did you try to keep going on for a bit? There are some pastors that try to keep going on for a bit, but they've lost the power a long time ago. But they keep on swinging the axe handle. They keep on, keep on. They can get by for a while. In the process of life, these things can happen to all of us. We lose our axe head. We lose our power for service. We lose our desire for our refilling of the Holy Spirit. 
We lose our desire to just wait upon God. We lose our desire and our thirst for the promise, Holy Spirit, and receiving Him. We lose the desire for the gift, the process of life. I just believe that it's, it's spiritual suicide to go on without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus promised it to us for a reason, he said you can't survive without him. You'll never make it in a dark and dingy and, and demon-fested world. You cannot make it without the power of the Holy Spirit as he comes upon you. He will equip you. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to download the Holy Spirit app all over again. A new year, a brand new infilling. It was in the early 1970s. I was just a little boy, what was I, 13, 14. I worked with my step-grandfather in the woods. He, had a, he was clearing up people's land, and, and, and he wanted me to help him. So we're leveling trees, and we didn't have access. We had chainsaws. And I remember I would sit on a stump in the woods. We'd sit, and he was, he was kind of like a mentor to me. We sit down, it was hot, and I would start telling him my problems back then. I didn't want to go to my mom and dad because, you know, I was in that age where mom and dad didn't know nothing. Boy, I've learned so much since then. Or they have. <laughs> but you know what it's like? You're young, you just saw it. My step-grandfather, he, he, was, he was a good mentor, and my parents were too. It was just that age I was going through. So I would talk to him, and I remember him saying to me one time as we're sitting on tree stuff, I can't believe this. Here I am, I'm paying you $2 an hour, and here we are sitting, and I'm counseling, and I'm talking to you about your life. Listen, I'm no stupid dude. At that age, I didn't feel like working either. So I didn't mind sitting on a little stump. But he was my mentor, and he would talk to me. He would in, talk to me about the things of God, talk to me about where I was going off the rail and how to get back on the rail. Every one of us need tree stump conversation. Where's your tree stump? Where's the person that you can sit down beside them and open up your mind and say, let's talk and you can help me and I'll listen. We all need tree stump conversations. Analyzing. Where do we go wrong? Get back on the rail. So if we were to sit down now for a moment and how about having a chat with Samson after the fact? What would he tell us? I wonder what Samson would say to you and I. He might say something like this. Be careful and be weary of soothing deceptive voices that sing good lullabies. He said they dangerously put you to sleep. See, in Judges chapter 16, after Deliah put him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to come on, shave his head. And so they shaved his head. He woke up and he tried. He tried to go on as he always did. You know, the axe handle. Just had the axe handle in his hand. I'll try to go on. But he soon discovered that he could not. The spirit, verse 20 says, the spirit had left him. He lost his power. He lost his strength. He became seized by the enemy. He became overtaken by the enemy. He became shackled by the enemy. The very enemy that he once defeated was now defeating him. A long time ago, he would say, that'll never happen to me. Never. But now he's being led around, so to speak, by the nose, by the enemy. Lost the power. Oh, the enemy has a soothing voice. He does. Satan can sound like an angel. You know how I know that? Because he's a great imitator. We know that about him. He can imitate very, very well. Before the fall, he was a beautiful angel adorned. Beautiful angel. Some say he led worship and led the worship and the music in heaven. You can read Ezekiel 28 for more information. But he knows the style. He knows the kind of music that you love. And he'll try to lure you to sleep. He'll try to sing you a lullaby when it comes to the things of God. Why would he want you to dig into the things of God? Why would he want you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit? He doesn't want you to have power. He doesn't want you to be triumphant over him. I want to, he said, I'll sing you a lullaby. I'll put you to sleep. You don't need the prayer app. 
don't pray. It's fine just the way it is. He's singing now, but I'm not going to sing. He said, you don't need the Holy Spirit app. You have all the power you need. You can do just fine the way you are. Go to sleep. Drift off into lullaby land. Gaze into the sunset. <clears throat> Become complacent. Don't be alert. The Bible says be sober. Be alert. No, I don't need any of that. No, no, no. You just go. You just let everything happen. You just let it roll. And soon, snap. It can happen. But the fire's gone. It's out. Before too long, the axe head is missing. The axe head is gone. And all we've got is a stick in our hand. That's all we got. The fire you once had, gone. Oh, and missions. Missions doesn't inspire any longer. And how about worship? Worship's not, it's an endurance. I don't really want to go to church this morning, but okay, I'll go. So you go. And with that guy, just shut up so I can go home and have my lunch. None of you are like that here. I, I don't know why I'm even saying that. I'm saying it can happen. Right? So slowly. I want to go home. See, so gradually, the lullabies, the singing, the axe head slipping. Slipping, slowly, nice lullabies, and soon ministry doesn't excite any longer. The flare is gone. The victory is gone. The smile on your face that once was there is not there any longer because the lullaby, we've gone to lullaby land, and we've lost what we once had. It can happen to anybody, I said earlier. This young seminary student realized, at some point he realized it's missing, and so he, he comes to the land of discovery, and he says, oh my, it's gone, it's gone, I've got to declare it, I've got to say it's gone. What I had is missing, I can't possibly try to cut this tree down without the axe head. My work is finished. I love the mentor, Elijah's response. He doesn't come down on him with a sledgehammer being borrowed and all that, no, no, all that stuff. He just goes over to him and says, where were you working? Son, I'll throw that in there. Where were you working? And so the young prophet says, well, it was over at this place, and here's where I was last working. I was, remember, I was swinging here and working hard, but it's in this general area. Then it went missing. That's where I lost it. And I believe there's some times that we can identify the where and the when, when the ship began to turn, left or right. Not always, but there are many times we can go back in time and say, okay, that was a point. That was where I stopped growing. Maybe it was an unanswered prayer. Or maybe you called upon God and it wasn't answered your way. So you got so mad at God and you said, I know that's when things begin to turn for me. I know I began to lose something when I was angry with God. I stopped praying. I stopped calling upon his name. Or maybe a Christian hurt you. And maybe you develop some bitterness and say, how can Christians live that way? And then the end result was you began to lose out. Didn't hurt them any, but it was hurting you. You got to stop looking at people. People are going to fail. People are going to not come through for you. It's going to happen. But you can't look at people. You've got to look at God. And you've got to look at your own faith journey. But sometimes we allow these things to distract. And suddenly we know, okay, that is when the boat began to turn to the right. I hit a bad speed bump and I couldn't get through. And my spiritual life began to suffer. I wasn't pulling up to the tap. I wasn't being filled with the Holy Spirit. I stopped being hungry and I began to coast. I stop doing devotions, and before long, we lose. The answer is not to pack it in and to leave the job site. That wasn't the answer for this young man, neither. The answer is to go back, to stop, and go back if he can. And then we read in the story that the restoration miracle happens. Elijah throws a stick in the water. And the iron axe head floats to the surface. The young student smiles, big smile. There it is. 
there it is, there it is, and he grabs it. And I'm sure that he grabbed it and got things back in place and went back to chopping down trees with a big smile on his face. I got the power back. I got the fire. I got the edge. I got the edge back that I once lost. Restoration is a great word. Restoration is a great work. It's a great miracle. Peter. Peter goes from denying Jesus and he goes from that place of weakness and fumbling and he goes to an upper room, but he's hungry, but he's thirsty and he wants more of Jesus, more of God. He wants the promise. Holy Spirit, you've been promised. I want the promise. I'm going for it. The Holy Spirit comes down upon Peter. (laughs) He comes out of that upper room and he becomes a preaching powerhouse for Jesus. And never again was Peter the same. He started preaching. He received the power of the Holy Spirit. What did he preach? Acts 2.38. He preached repentance. He started declaring and preaching to the crowds, repent, turn your hearts toward Jesus. Secondly, he started preaching about the promised Holy Spirit. It's not just for me. It's not just for us. It's for you and your children, for all those that come after us. It's for you. The promised Holy Spirit. It's promised to everyone. Stand with me, please. I ask the worship team to come. Could I challenge you this morning? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, probably one of the most misunderstood persons in the Bible, personality, force, we call it it, but he's he, person. Can I challenge you when you go home today to take your Bible, just begin to read through the book of Acts. I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. What Jesus said to his disciples, his followers, and we are his followers today. He said on one occasion, he's eating with them. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John truly baptized with water. But in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After that, he was taken up from them. Oh, they gazed for a while. They looked up into the sky. The angel said, come on, get to the prayer room. Get to the place of waiting. Then you go into Acts chapter 2 where they waited. And they called upon the Lord. There was hunger. There was thirst. And the Spirit came down. That's what I pray that we would download in this new year. The Holy Spirit act. The application. Apply the power to your life. It just means that you've got such a hunger for Jesus. It just means you call upon Him and say, Lord, I know that I can't make it in this world by myself. And you call upon his name. And you ask for the promise of the Holy Spirit the disciples had and that he promised to everyone else that would come after him. I desire that too. And he'll come. He came upon my life in July 1975 at camp. I called upon the Lord. He filled me with his Holy Spirit. And he desires to do the same thing in your life this morning. And I know it's 1230 and people need to 
be dismissed. The kids' church is wrapping up downstairs. But I'm not really going to officially conclude the service this afternoon. But the worship team are going to lead us in a song. And you just dismiss yourself as you have to, and as you need to. Take this message with you this week. But if you just want to hang around a little bit in the pew and just display your hunger for God, then I encourage you to do so. If you want someone to gather with you and support you and minister to you and pray with you, you just come to the front. Just allow what God wants to do to happen in you today. May the Lord richly bless you.